as it is our vision focus this year, this make Jesus your mentor, pray, share, welcome, it is welcome that we are focusing on this year. And as we've been talking more about welcoming people into our congregation and helping them know their God's love through our fellowship, many of you have shared with me frustrations. Frustrations with how many times you may have invited important friends in your life or family members in your life to come to this church and they look at you as if you're trying to sell them some really lousy product or maybe that you're a little bit crazy or maybe you're pushy and maybe you've even heard back some horrific story about those churches and what churches are about or what Christians are about or some horror story of someone's abuse at the hands of a church. And if it's true, if you've shared that frustration, as you know Jennifer and I have <laughs> as pastors, you'll understand better, I think, this teaching parable of Jesus, of the king's banquet. Here the king calls for this amazing wedding banquet, and people refuse the invitation. Who does that? When the Prince William got married to Kate Middleton, did anybody refuse an invitation and said, oh, no, I got soccer that day? <laughs> I don't think so. And so the king, so frustrated, giving all this generous love and people not responding, he says to his messengers, OK, fine. If those people over there are so important and have it so together that they don't even need a good meal from me, go out and invite other people, whoever you run into. That homeless guy under the bridge, invite him. That leper who's begging at the steps of the temple, invite her. That child who has no home, who is the wrong color, maybe a little undocumented, Invite that child. This is the radical abundance of God's love that so offended those who would be gatekeepers at the kingdom of heaven. This great banquet parable of Jesus would have brought comfort, I think, to um, Matthew's hearers, you know, it's told in the book of Matthew, because at the time of Matthew, about 80 years after Jesus was born, 50-ish years after his crucifixion, the temple had been destroyed by the Romans. The world was a mess, and the disciples were increasingly being persecuted for preaching the good news of Christ the Messiah of the Jews. They were being thrown out of their home places of worship, their synagogues. They were sometimes being beaten or imprisoned. They were just a little bit frustrated by the reception they were getting by the very faithful religious people that really should have been very excited about this good news. And so they went forth into the Roman world, the Greek world, into the world of unclean pagans who were amazingly receptive, amazingly receptive. I shared this with the confirmation overnight. Um, last night, we did a little time traveling and reenacted a worship service as in the early church in the catacombs beneath Rome during a time of persecution, a time when Christians had to go into hiding, when some of them were being crucified and burned alive and, of course, also eaten by wild beasts in the Colosseum. It was a tremendous time of church growth. The fires of the martyrs started a wildfire of conversions that doesn't make any sense to us in respectable American Protestant Christianity, where so many of our churches are empty or nearly empty. So what's the difference? <laughs> When I was uh, home in North Carolina, my dad was really excited. He's almost 89. 
he scored tickets to Paul McCartney. <laughs> Hard to get those tickets. That's a golden ticket, paid good money for it too. How much did he have to pay to go to church on Sunday? Are we selling ourselves too cheaply? Are we not owning the amazing, fabulous feast of God's love that we get to experience right here? I love you people because you are so overflowing with the Holy Spirit. You are not dead Christians. I know the Spirit of God, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Every time I shake one of your hands, every time one of you gives me a hug or says you're praying for me, that's worth other people knowing about because I'm telling you, most of the time in the grocery store or in Target, they may ask me, how are you? But they don't want to know about my Uncle Jake in the nursing home and how sad it is to watch his decline. This is a place where God's love is served up on a silver platter, and we get to feast on it. <laughs> so why, why do we stop ourselves from talking about it? I, I have a confession to make. So Jennifer and I just got back from Kendra's ordination, Kendra Joyner Miller, our summer student of last year, not this past year, but anyway, 2013. It was a joyous occasion in Salisbury, North Carolina. Her campus minister happened to have been my youth minister from back uh, right after he got out of Yale. So he actually got kind of emotional preaching the sermon. He was like, he suddenly realized he was in the grandpa generation <laughs> of pastors. The student he taught had taught a student who is now being ordained. But you know what was sad? It was this enormous church, twice the size, and there were 25 people there. Lord, have mercy on us. And yet, my confession is, when Jennifer and I checked into the hotel, and they're like, oh, what are you? and how are you? Are you having a good day? And what brings you to Salisbury? And you know what we said? We're on a business trip. <laughs> I mean, do you really want to get started? Oh, yeah, well, I, are you saved? And What kind of church is that? Is that a real church? Do you ordain women? I just didn't want to go. <laughs> Couple of eternal life insurance salesmen, that's what we were. <laughs> so being a Christian today is so easy. I think many of us don't bother with it. And usually there's at least a little bit of resistance from every new confirmation class. You know, there are a number of them, they do what they're told, they come to church, their parents think it's good for them, like they're vitamins. So it's just been the joy of my life to get to see little sparks of excitement catch on like we did last night. To see them go from slumped on the couch to sitting up a little bit more. It's a good thing. It's World Communion Sunday, and it's a Sunday where we celebrate how different world cultures celebrate their faith a little bit differently with different styles. My father was a delegate years ago to the World Council of Churches in Africa, in Nairobi, and it was just astonishing to him, a good old southern boy from Kentucky, you know, this kind of music. It's like, that's church music, you know? All around the world, we have different ways of being Christians. And right here in Brookfield, we have different ways of being Christian. And I think sometimes the biggest culture gap that the church has to bridge is not welcoming an Iraqi refugee, but welcoming our own next generation of young people into the church. I'm here to tell you there ain't many people under 30 who go out of their way to listen to organ music. If you look at what's on their Pandora listing, it's not 
Handel. And it's not much bell choir music either, but I love you guys anyway. <laughs> we have such a challenge that I don't think we um, have fully acknowledged. I think sometimes we've given up the battle before it starts. And I want to tell you from the stories I've heard you tell me about what your faith means to you, we actually are pretty well equipped to tell the story to the next generation, which, by the way, the book of Deuteronomy says is our um, command. Teach these laws. Teach God's law of love to the next generation. Teach it to them as you walk along the way, when you rise, when you lie down, every chance you get. Speak of God's love and what it means in your life. It's a challenge. But our kids rose to it last night. What I loved is we had last year's, what was this year's confirmation class, 2014's confirmation class, led this retreat for 2015's confirmation class. Because those kids aren't going to believe me when I tell them it's good. It's my job. I'm selling them that eternal life insurance. But to see the joy of what it means to be a full and whole member of the Church of Jesus Christ at age 16, at age 15, that's powerful. Because I'm telling you, the rest of the world looks at those kids and goes, well, one day you're going to amount to something if you really work hard. Maybe you'll cut the mustard. Our church looks at them and says, not you are the future of our church. You are our church. We have turned the world upside down by the gospel of Jesus Christ, where the last is first and the first is last. And the child shall lead us dancing into the kingdom of heaven. It ain't the way Caesar's world works. In Caesar's world, it is all about who's got the most money, who has the best job, who's got the most education, who's got the biggest car. But God doesn't look on us that way. God says, who has my love written on their heart? And who has the courage to go into this world full of angry, awful people and dare to share it? And so I have challenged some of you in the last couple of weeks. I was asking, who are these people out who aren't coming to our church? Where are they on Sunday morning? How can we reach them? When I was in um, Santa Cruz, I was shocked by a little walk I took down by the waterfront. And uh, it's where all the surfers hang out early in the morning. I was taking my daughter to college, and my internal clock was all messed up because I thought I was, you know, I thought it was. 10 in the morning, it was 7. So I was out there with the early morning surfers, and they had such a community of love. What a great group of people. They were asking about each other's family. Well, there wasn't any waves. That's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the fishermen when nothing's biting. There was a lot to talk about, not a lot to do. But it, I felt like I was in somebody else's church. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't my culture. It was actually a Sunday morning. I was going to have to move my daughter into the dorm on Sunday morning because who goes to church? Why would you need to do anything other than stuff? But this was before that, and, um, and I asked a fellow who was there taking pictures, I said, is it always like this? And he said, yeah, these are great folks. And I believed it because they had this amazing wall of memorials to surfers who had died on those rocks down below. This was a community that loved one another. But here's the kicker. Across the street, there was a church. This is very limited parking at the surfing cliffs, but an enormous parking lot across the street, size of our parking lot, with a big old gate across the front and two signs, one that said in great big red letters, no trespassing. The other one that said, church parking only. No skateboarders, no surfers, no cyclists, 
All others will be towed by order of the Santa Cruz Police Department Ordinance 777. And I had to say, what would 30-year-old Jesus be doing on a beautiful day like that? Would he be counting out dry wafers to hand out to a bunch of dead Christians? Or would he be going fishing for people? This is our call, people of faith. Who are the people around us? We welcome them, but how do we get them to step across the threshold? Some of the people we know may be on the sports field. I'll tell you what, the real challenge is asking those people who really need church. Do you know the people I mean? The ones who are really annoying, the ones who yell at the ref, who yell at their kids? who yell at the other parents, do they need, or do they not need the love of God? They need something from God, maybe a good smiting. <laughs> I think that spirit of anger and fear and competition comes from a lack of belief in the solid ground on which we stand, which is the love of God in Jesus Christ. When you receive that love and you trust that love, you don't need to put down other people to be good. So look around you this week. Tell me who you see and invite them to church. For God spreads out this amazing abundant feast for us and it is too good not to be shared. Thanks be to God.